guys, I want to welcome you to the weekly Wednesday for the Financial Freedom Newsletter, where every week, every Wednesday, we delve into something inspirational, motivational, something excerpt taken from the Financial Freedom Weekly Newsletter. Wherever you are, if you're listening on Spotify, on iTunes, Google, be sure to click the like, subscribe, share, comment. Without ado, let's get into the show. Welcome, everybody, to this week's podcast episode for the Financial Freedom Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Christopher Liu. And in that light, I'm always advocating for four pillars of freedom, time, financial, location, health freedom. And I'm always interviewing CEOs, entrepreneurs, people doing things on the cutting edge, changing the world for the better. And today. We have uh, Mike. He's also the CEO of Norhart. And Norhart is a $200 million apartment developer building high quality housing for 20 to 30% less by transforming the industry. Kind of reminds me of uh, 3D printing of houses. So he's calling in from Minnesota. It's going to be a great topic about residential real estate, kind of the bread and butter for this audience. And um, it's going to be a great conversation. So, uh, Mike, welcome. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, uh, I know, uh, like, like we were talking backstage, you know, r- real estate, that's kind of, um, like, you know, very, uh, I would say, established asset class. Um, so tell us um, more about you, your company, and what you do. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. We design, yeah. we build, and we rent apartments. But we're transforming the way that's done by incorporating technologies and techniques that have really revolutionized other industries. And what that's doing for us is it's helping us drive down the cost of construction. And the powerful thing about that is I think by doing this, we can have a meaningful impact on the world's, or at least the United States' housing affordability crisis. I mean, you you hit the nail on the head for, um, I mean, real estate prices just gone off the, out of the roof, um, especially with QE. Um, we'll see what it happens in the next year or so. And uh, rent, housing prices, you know, gen, uh, millennials, Gen Z can't afford homes. Home quality is terrible. Uh, supply, you know, things are just, it's just, and I, I love what people are doing to um, help address these. So um, we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about big things. One is, uh, so uh, the one thing every real estate expert gets wrong. Tell us about that. You know, in real estate, it feels, at least in the construction world, because the cost of real estate, I think, is ultimately driven by construction. I think in that world, what a lot of people get wrong is that they get kind of stuck in their ways. If you look at the past 60 years, manufacturing has improved labor productivity by 760%. Agriculture, 1,500%. Do you have a guess of what our industry developing out real estate has been? I couldn't even fathom it's been 10 percent. it's been basically nothing this is crazy it's unsustainable yeah. it's a key driver of why home prices and rental prices have risen so much and i think by changing the mindset and applying the principles learned in these other industries we can really drive down those costs but i think that's the biggest mindset change that has to happen in people is realizing it is possible and that we can do it if we're willing to change our ways yeah. Um, so what uh, what techniques do you use to lower the cost of construction? Yeah, so uh, there's dozens of things that we use, but I'll give you one example. And that is that in d- construction, a lot of times the owner is different than the developer, who's different than the general contractor coordinating all the construction, who's different than the subcontractor, your plumbers, your electricians, your HVAC guys, who's different than your supplier, and your manufacturer. What yeah. we're starting to, what we've done is to bring all of these in house. So we're the owner, developer, we're the whole chain, all the way down to we are, we have our own precast concrete facilities where we generate these giant beams out of concrete and steel. But bringing all that in house helps us reduce costs for one. But second, it enables techniques that have been seen or been used well in manufacturing. For example, we take a project and we divide the whole thing out into smaller chunks. Maybe that's a unit. It might be down to a half unit. Then what we're doing is we give our teams 
only a few hours, right now it's five hours, to complete their work in that unit. That means that every five hours, we produce a new apartment unit. And just by doing that, by let's us condense the work down in a way that's untraditional in construction, we can take an 18-month project and drop it down to nine months. Hmm. And uh, when one thing, because uh, you know, I had a couple of my units remodeled, and it, it, one thing is coordination. Mm. And you know, there's always with construction because you're dealing with people and regular, you know, all these. Um, you know, how do you how do you coordinate all of these things? Like sometimes they need more. You don't have labor. You, then you don't have parts. You need more parts. You know. Um, you you can't get the permits. Uh, you know, some something's always going wrong in construction. So tell us how you mitigate those type of um factors. Yeah, to expound on your point first, like imagine if if the construction industry produced cars, you'd have somebody different doing the wheels, someone different doing the windshield, and someone different doing the door. And then the door company would say, Ah, sorry, I can't get here this week. And then they you would tell them, I want you to work on one car at a time. They would throw up their hands and say, there's no way I need a hundred cars coming in there and I'm walking out, right? So you solve that problem in large part by bringing those teams in house, but that's not enough because a lot of construction people have an old way of thinking and there's a culture in the construction world that's stereotypically not super positive, not super engaging. And so we spent a lot of time and attention on hiring the right people and building the right culture. In fact, 5% of the staff in our company are recruiters because we're fighting to find people who are literally best in the world of what they do. And when you bring people of that caliber together, they're excited to change the way work is done and to solve those very issues you're talking about. Mm, interesting. And it reminds me of um, what uh, Bezos did with Amazon. Now he has his mm. own. He basically cut out FedEx and UPS, and he has his own. Um, exactly. Uh, I'm sure. I mean, and plus, you know, with uh, robots and AI, I'm not saying to <laughs> replace labor workers, but you know, this is kind of where the trends are going. And um, one thing that's really on my mind is uh, where does 3D printing fit into all of this uh, construction or on-demand printing and all of that. It's really interesting because the world of the media jumps on the most exciting new features or what have you. And 3D printing is one piece of that puzzle, but there are dozens of more mundane, less exciting things that make a bigger impact than something like 3D printing. But 3D printing is something we're carefully watching. And in some ways, we do things that feel a little bit like 3D printing. Like we have robotics that build out a wall. And it's a fully completed exterior wall. Uh, and then they drop it in place on our buildings like Lego blocks. And so, yeah, the, we don't develop that on site, but it's being developed through the factory. And um, But I, I do, I think 3D printing has a place and we and we will likely use utilize some of that technology in the future. Yeah. Uh, before we get into sort of the macro landscape you know, with interest rates and all of that, um, I have some other questions is um you have the you have some of the quote best advice for real estate development that is rarely followed. Um, tell us more about that. I think the thing that is rarely I think real estate developers don't want to get into construction, right? So that that's someone else's job. That's someone else's thing. And it's very very segmented of a market then. so they don't, they don't really dive in to drive down those costs. It's, I should say, it's incredibly hard. Elon Musk talks about uh, building a car is hard. Building the system that builds cars is a hundred times harder. It's the same way with construction. I can build you a building, but to build the system that drives and reduces the cost of those buildings is so, so much harder. I've got some scars to prove it. Yeah, um, but if you... If you build the systems and you get the systems right, then it's basically makes everything easy. So it's like you're building infrastructure as opposed to like kind of building individual units. You're basically, um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Exactly. Yeah. And then if we can scale that up nationwide, we can actually have a meaningful impact on housing prices. So where, where does this all fit into the, um, if basically you can manufacture, if you can 
create houses that for cheaper and better quality what does that do the does the property value still like when you go to market is it still the same is it undervalued so or is it like you you hire you to construct this um building you get a purchase and basically you the difference is your is your, your profit yeah so all of our stuff is market priced at the moment and i should mention too even though we're a lower cost we still have some of the nicest properties for example, we're, we're producing right now a $100 million project in Minnesota. It's going to be one of the nicest department buildings in the entire state. Uh, but what we do is you use those profits to blow back into producing and building up the infrastructure. The infrastructure is tremendously expensive, but that's how we fund it is through those profits. Now, our goal in the long term is to scale up the infrastructure to be producing units at such a rate that supply and demand factors actually start to reduce the market price of housing. And that's when you get affordable housing in a sustainable market-based way. Oh, interesting. Because a lot of, uh, you you know, if I were a um, politician or, you know, uh, in City Hall and I hear housing prices because basically property taxes are a tax on wealth and mm. and it's also a revenue generator for the city. So for schools, et cetera. So for you to come in and um you know have the housing market lower don't, would would you expect any sort of backlash or fighting from you know regulators and politicians in today's market no everyone wants more affordable housing it feels like i have a i guess i could imagine in a world in 20 years where we really scale this thing up or in 10 years that people get a little upset that housing is no longer always going up if we can actually have a meaningful impact. Um, so yeah, I could see some backlash, but certainly not anytime soon. It's the opposite right now. Interesting. Yeah, um, I'm just, and um, so we talk about uh, affordable housing and now let's, so where do you see the uh, real estate market? Uh, there's so much debate um, People say keep investing. Some people say bubble. What do, what is um how does the Federal Reserve's interest rate changes mm. affecting development? It's made massive changes, right? The interest rate has risen substantially. What that does in real estate is banks typically fund deals. And I'll give you our deals as an example. That hundred million dollar project in Minnesota. Our cost on hundred million dollar project is sixty five million dollars, which is fantastic. A bank is typically willing to fund at 75 million. Wow. Most developers have to put money into projects. We actually pull money out of projects. Because of the interest rate environment, banks have become more cautious. And now they're only providing 55 million instead of 75 million. So now developers have to bring more money to the table. And for us, it's not a big deal because our costs are so low but for so many developers. And I just got out of a conference this morning. Where developers were talking about this for so many developers, their deals don't pencil anymore, right? They don't, they were so much on the bubble, the border that now with higher interest rates, the math just doesn't work. They can't actually give, uh, the interest rates are actually higher than what we call cap rates, which is sort of the return on the overall project. So the equity investors get dismal of a return and equity investors aren't interested in that then yeah um i'm talking you know some of my colleague friends in uh they're in real estate and then they're saying um uh basically keeping your cost of debt low uh keeping your um all of your operating expenses low right now we're like in a lean kind of startup environment and um and uh basically to hedge against those uh, increases you know the cost of capital and mm. debt which is interesting. The other, you know, with that, uh, people say that with um, how the real estate the market kind of lags the equity market. And so equity markets, you know, took a hit last year. And um, some say it's going to, there's a recession looming. Um, you know, the number inflation numbers were actually positive this morning. But um, what do you see like the real estate market uh, this year, next year? Is it going to lag it? Is it going to stay stable? What are, you, what are you seeing? Yeah, so when you look at some of the stats, like new housing, new apartment starts right now is down. It's at one of the lowest levels it's been in years. And that's just recent in the last quarter. Uh, the new, for housing inventory, the new house inventory levels are at like nine months, which is as high as it was in 2008. And so 
what happens is that developers, it takes two years to get a project approved and, and completed. And so there's all these projects in the works that will continue to be in the works. So you got this supply coming on board where the demand side is softening, right? And uh, so we're going to see, I think, housing in a tougher spot in the next year or two. And then after that, I think it's going to flip because all the developments that are not happening now, you're going to see the, a leg or a, a shortage in a year or two. One of the things that we're doing for the investors that are involved with us is in order to protect investors, we're actually building on a platform where people can actually earn an attractive interest rate that's independent of the, the real estate itself, where you can just earn a flat interest rate every single month uh, on the money you put in. And because of the nature of our business, because our costs are so low, we can protect that money quite well and allow investors to get an attractive rate while not seeing the downside of the market. Mm, interesting. And uh, well, and then what sort of um, things do you do to uh, like what sort of returns can people uh, expect and, you know, what sort of strategies are you using to provide that return? Yeah. So our, um, so that hundred million dollar project, for example, values at a hundred million dollars, our loan on it is $55 million. What we're doing is we're opening up a window between that 55 to 65 to 75 window. So maybe 10 to $20 million for that project. We'll put money into it through this vehicle. What's nice from an investor standpoint is that real estate has to drop by 20 or 30% before they even get touched at all, right? And so we take that risky point because we trust, you know, uh, we can trust ourselves quite well. The investors take that middle ground where the bank takes the, the least risky spot. So that's the way we protect the investors. This is actually a newer platform for us. And so it actually doesn't launch for until spring of this year for mm -hmm. people to have access to it. And so uh, the interest rates will be quite attractive, but we haven't uh, announced what those rates will be, in part because it'll depend on the interest rate environment in three to four months. Yeah. And um, yeah, so very interesting uh, conversation. Uh, I'm always interested in hearing about what new people are doing. And as we come to the uh, conclusion or nearing the conclusion, what's the long-term impact you hope Nora Hart will make on the housing industry? You know, one thing I think a lot about, you know, my, my dad died relatively young and I think how short life really is. So the question I ask myself is how do I want to spend the minutes that we have here on earth? And for me, the answer to that is I've always wanted to make some kind of meaningful, positive impact in the world. And that positive impact that I think we can make in our lifetime is to drive down the cost of housing to make it more affordable for us. Yeah, really. Uh, so that's a really powerful why. And um, I really enjoyed this conversation. How For people listening, how can people um, follow you on social media, visit your website, contact you? Yeah, our website is norhart.com. That's N O R H A R T.com. On there, you can click and see our invest tab where you can learn more about the investment options and sign up for a newsletter. Be the first to be uh, allowed into that program. We also have a podcast that we're launching in a month or two that's uh, being recorded right now on what it takes to become a unicorn or a billion dollar company. Um, and you can also connect through there onto my social media. And for all the listeners out there, Mike, uh, you can be followed on Facebook, LinkedIn, Insta, Twitter, and YouTube. So be sure to check those out in his website. And with that, thanks so much for coming onto the show and thanks for providing so much value to the guests. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. listening if you liked it be sure to like comment share subscribe we're on everywhere spotify itunes google amazon audible and without much ado be sure to thank this show's sponsors and we'll see you next week